Hi, uh, I'm Steve Moxon, an independent cross-disciplinary science review researcher, writer, focusing on the sexes. Uh, I'm interested in bottom-up from biology, multi-level explanations of anything and everything to do with the sexes. Uh, this video is in conjunction with my new paper, How and Why Partner Violence is Normal Female Behaviour, but Aberrational Male Behaviour, and it's my third on the topic. Um, all I say here is supported by a citation, all to be found in the paper, obviously with more detailed and precise exposition, but here, bar for one section, uh, and unless someone is key, uh, I'll not clutter up things and, and test your patience. Uh, and I'll abbreviate partner violence to PV. There is another PV presentation at this conference uh, by Nicola Graham Kevin, uh, a leading academic expert on PV here in England. Uh, it was she who commissioned for her journal uh, my first paper on the topic. Uh, Nicola argues, uh, me too, uh, to coin a bad phrase, uh, that men are just as much victims as our women, refuting feminist activist research. Nicola and others put forward what's dubbed the non-gendered paradigm of gender symmetry in PV perpetration to neatly contrast uh, with the feminist gendered violence paradigm of uh, gender asymmetry. The premise, uh, rightly for scientific inquiry, is the simplest one, which is that PV is not some special form of violence, but part and parcel of aggression generally. However, this entails that either party to PV, and whether it's one way or mutual or reciprocal, is presumed to be behaving in similar ways for similar reasons. In other words, that the sexes effectively are interchangeable, at least in this context. Well, the sexes are not interchangeable. They are profoundly different, with contrasts in behaviour and motivation likely to be especially apparent in intersexual scenarios, obviously, as is PV. So this context is not one where it might be anticipated that the sexes would appear similar. The problem is, a perspective that PV is non-gendered forces data into a one-size-fits-all mould, even where it shows significant, indeed far more, female perpetration and male victimhood, as the data does. Professor Stephen Thiebert, over several decades now, has collated every single study looking at PV in both directions, of the same couples, so there's no cherry picking of studies and he continues to conclude that there is significantly greater female than male perpetration. Ditto the other major recent review across all sample types, well, apart from police reports obviously. Likewise, ironically, all the data from the US National Violence Against Women survey even. Prizing these findings into the non-gendered model the overall picture is often said to be that women are at least as partner violence as are men. That's akin to saying that something is as good as any, when actually what is meant is the best. It's coyly playing things down. An overcautious conclusion, understandable, given how inhospitable is academia to anything non-feminist, never mind anti-feminist. The actual asymmetry that's the inverse of the feminist position, may well be enormous, considering the disparity between what you might expect an actual sex differential PV injury rate. Uh, the forensic psychologist Linda Dixon uh, calculated that with men far stronger in their upper body, therefore in their hitting power, and women having fragile body frames, hence susceptibility to injury, there should be roughly 20 times as much injury to females through PV, even assuming no more male than female perpetration. Yet, actual PV injuries show a small, if any, sex differential overall, a much greater male serious injury rate, and, after multiple adjustments of raw data, likely a significant large majority of male spousal murder victims, and I outline and present evidence on this in my previous 2014 paper, paper on PV, female modes are either by a third party, in which case it wouldn't be recorded as spousal murder, or direct but covert, classically 
poisoning or a staged accident. All relying on our unwillingness to see females as killers. And even this 20-fold disparity between predicted and actual injury rates is to likely understate it, given much male PV injury will be missed in hospital and police protocols of inquiring about injuries not being applied as either policy or in practice as for women. There is no explanation for this massive, unexpected, non-existent and in important ways reversed sex, differ dif sex differential than that female perpetration must be more, hugely more, than assumed. The feminist model cannot remotely fit its truth inversion. So how is so much female perpetration and male victimhood missed? In the great bulk of PV research, there are major confounding factors of perception and in reporting. Male-female interaction that is in any way physical or aggressive or mistaken as such is readily construed as male on female PV, but not as female on male PV. And there is male relative to female under reporting of victimhood, which is an insurmountable problem in survey based research, which is most of PV research, where there isn't cross checking in thoroughgoing dyadic, i.e., two person study. So, why don't males? report PV. Plenty of research shows that males do not categorise PV against them as actually being violence and females consider their own violence against a partner as non-harmful expressive aggression and not PV per se. I'll unpack this shortly but as, as well as and underpinning this is the male imperative to maintain status. Uh, what we mean by status is the overall outcome of male-male composition, indicating their genetic quality, which is male mate value, obviously determining their access to sex. Crucially important for males. Men individually keep very quiet or are even silent regarding any sort of weakness, especially of sustaining violence, because it's the ultimate indication of low status. There is evidence in all forms uh, of, of male weakness in all contexts whenever investigated of males not telling anyone they're a victim and not asking for any help. And there's a mini review uh, of this in my paper on the falsity of identity politics, which is published last year. This will be expected particularly as regards violence from those with whom males are not even in competition and, as I'll outline shortly, feel they are meant to protect females. Even anonymous survey designed to exclude what are known as the demand characteristics known to evoke male underreporting, nevertheless still results in male underreporting. It's a deep-seated phenomenon. And the sex differential in reporting victimhood is further widened through female vulnerability being sexually attractive, posing as the damsel in distress to draw male attention by evoking sexual interest and or natural male protectiveness towards females likely drives female over-reporting. But this is not even mentioned in the literature as a possibility, but then hardly either is false reporting of victim or despite being a well-attested, extremely common cover for and form of female perpetration. Or indeed the typical mischaracterization of male attempt to restrain female PV a sex differential in reporting victimhood through male underreporting has been researched, giving an estimate of tenfold and orders of magnitude. Uh, the UK Office of National Statistics, the ONS, states it's threefold, taking into account even the latter, more conservative estimate would transform any raw data not already showing greater female perpetration. We'd end up with the status quo ante, how it used to be. Uh, there used to be uh, uh, gaudy, um, saucy uh, seaside postcards in England. And apart from the sex angle, one of the common themes was of husband battering, you know, red faced, angry wife uh, chasing husband, wielding heavy household implement. 
And if you go back to medieval times, church Messiah records, or like the, the backrest for the choristers, they used to have uh, wonderful wood carvings of vernacular scenes. And one of the uh, chief themes there was husband battering. So it indicates uh, in early modern, uh, fairly modern, and in medieval times, um, females being the chief perpetrators of PV was understood fully by everyone. The falsity of the standard picture is uncovered in all of the four most recent major reviews of PV theories, one this year, a couple in 2018, one in 2019, I think. The conclusion of all of which being that current theory is hopelessly inadequate, at best a contribution to a merely partial understanding, and that theories are empirically untested still. And three different research teams have all put out very recent papers complaining of a lack of thoroughgoing dyadic study of PV. It's an amazing situation since partner violence self-evidently essentially is a dyadic phenomenon. Well actually there are now quite a number of recent and very recent such studies uh, plus reviews of all past studies and they all show at the very least a two-fold excess of male of female over male perpetration whether uni or bi-directional with women girls initiating escalating persisting with and retaliating much more than do men excess female perpetration is by any and every metric and the sex differentials in some cases are far more than twofold and sometimes huge the beauty of this dyadic research is that not only is it holistic, but it focuses mainly on young adults and adolescents, capturing the phenomenon at or near its inception. This, of course, is the way to get at the etiology. Now, I'm going to quickly run through these dyadic, these thoroughgoing dyadic studies. Bear with me. I need to get the full flavour of this stuff across to you so you understand the nature of the the overwhelming uh, nature of the research in the field. Heinz, Strauss and Douglas in their 2020 paper titled Using Dyadic Concordance Types to Understand Frequency of Intimate Partner Violence find much more female perpetration both bidirectional and unidirectional. Same pattern found specifically in young couples surprising the investigators Leonard et al 2014 five times as many female only as male only PV couples and a large subset of bi-directional couples where the female violence was overwhelmingly greater and the echoes here of a number of studies e.g. Robertson and Marachva 2007, Whitaker et al. 2007, Williams and Fries 2005. Reviewing thoroughgoing dyadic studies Bartholomew and Cobb 2011 concluded not only was perpetration largely female but much more by women when the violence was entirely one way. Reviewing all post-1990 studies of bi and unidirectionality in young adults and adolescents, Lan Rich Ryson, Rowling et al. 2012, shows twice as many, twice as much female unilateral perpetration, regardless of sample type. Most recently, Rays et al. 2019 find 12% of the girls perpetrators but only five percent of boys with a male subgroup exclusively victimized that's not returning aggression at all the authors citing Gonsi et al 2016 as discovering the same pattern Johnson et al 2015 found that the perpetrator only group is overwhelmingly female 90 percent of all the sample with again a twofold sex differential overall in perpetration so for 20 to 24 year olds, 29% of females, 15% of males. A study of late adolescence by Testa Hoffman and Leonard in 2010 showed just 1% of couples featured male only violence as against 14% female only. And of the 20% mutually violent, 69% were predominantly female violent with a mere 7% being mostly male violence. The authors note this is consistent with studies over the previous decade. For example, O'Leary and Slep, 2003, found just 8% of boys but 15% of girls engaged in physical violence and girls were considerably more likely than boys to persist with it. Another rare, another though rare study mode here is simply to observe interactions 
the first ever such being of adolescence by Capaldi and Crosby, 1997. 6% of males, but 16% of females perpetrated physical PV, considered by the coders to be not playful. In only 4% of the couples was it male only, whereas in 17% it was female only. A particular use of observation studies is establishing who initiates, as was the focus of the Capaldi, Kim and Short, 2007, in finding 18 to 24 year old females three to four times more likely to initiate than males. Specifically regarding adolescence and at least twofold overall sex differential of excess female over male perpetration is a very robust conclusion. Meta-analytic review by Winston Tack Connolly and Card, 2017, showed overall prevalence rates for perpetration of 13% of boys and 25% of girls. And a similar twofold sex differential, likewise looking at adolescence, is found by Taketa Montero, 2016, Carl Vettel, 2016, and Taylor and Mumford, 2016. That this is not culture specific is shown, for example, by a study of Latino youth by Razor Tal, 2017. They found 22% of boys reported victimhood as against only 9% of girls, whereas perpetration was reported by 17% of girls and a mere 2% of boys. Sex differentials of twofold plus and eightfold plus, respectively. Examination of teenage couples over a decade revealed no change in the considerably higher rates of victimisation of boys over that of girls, Schaefer et al. 2018. The pattern is also confirmed in a study using multiple focus groups, quote, both males and females explain that dating violence is more often perpetrated by females, unquote. Taylor et al. 2017. Self-report by adolescent females of greater perpetration than males was previously found by Foschi et al. 2009 and Ligreca and Harrison 2005. Finally, perhaps the most comprehensive dyadic study on adolescent couples is by Sifche, uh, sorry, Burke and Sifche Kenk. Uh, two sets of studies and papers uh, in 2015. The breakdown of their dyad types is instructive. Uh, the most common, at 20%, dubbed physical female, is of unilaterally violent females receiving little if any male aggressive response. Next most numerous, at 18%, is the aggressive female type, where females are both psychologically and physically aggressive. Only third in prevalence is this corresponding aggressive male type at 14%. Mutually aggressive couples are a mere 6% and remain non-aggressive. The preponderance here of unilaterally or more or less unilaterally violent females over males is almost threefold with more than half of all females being violent. Most tellingly, the authors conclude, quote, in all of the dyads with aggressive females, male partners did not respond with aggression. This points to gender-specific functions and interpretations of aggression. A large proportion in our sample consisted of dyads with one-sided aggressive profiles in which females were more aggressive than their male partners. The lack of aggressive responses of their male partners suggests a gender-specific pattern in the evaluation and application of aggression as a way of resolving relationship conflicts. Male self-silencing as a pattern of dealing with female aggression has been consistently found among married and cohabiting adult couples and according to our findings seems to have an early onset." Unquote. Overwhelming evidence then that PV perpetration is far more by females than by males. Clearly, theory has to start again from scratch. Males and females are different, the basis of which being that the female necessarily is the limiting factor in reproduction, as we all know. So, unlike males, females are never in surplus, so to speak. So it has always been an imperative for males, but not for females, to avoid injuring their partners. And there must have been profound adaptation going way back in evolutionary time to prevent this in our psychology concerning aggression and policing the behaviour of others. Well, implicit cognition is evident from very earliest ages 
in an unspoken rule that the male must protect the female, just as is seen in chimpanzee males who will risk their own lives in this. And it's found that uh, in mixed adult focus groups discussing violence, quote, the single most frequent, greater than 30% type of comment involved men protecting women. In contrast, women were never discussed as protectors of men, unquote. Boys and girls play games about boys protecting girls. And boys as young as four frequently say boys protect girls. It surely has a, a very deep-seated evolved origin. Interestingly, ubiquitous profound male protectiveness towards females explains our ready misperception of PV as only being male, per male perpetrated. There's a very reason it's unusual a male's PV is seen to be aberrant and unjustifiable. And the opprobrium this evokes through our deep sense of needing to protect the female prompts over anticipation in what's called error management mode. And a high number of false positives are an acceptable cost here given the importance of preventing the behaviour. So it is that uncommon behaviour, as is as PV, as is male and female PV, comes to be imagined instead as default and requiring special efforts to thwart. Well, in the past, of course, folk wisdom, as you might call it, that men hold back, whereas women may let fly, would correct such truth inversion. But currently, hegemonic feminist ideology instead builds on and massively reinforces the evolved cognitive bias to pathological levels, as we all too well know. It's a dysfunctional cultural runaway problem, a parallel of the evolutionary runaway given the peacock its ridiculous, unruly tail. And the corollary of heightened, indeed over-visible male perpetration and female victimhood is rendering effectively invisible female perpetration and male victimhood. So it's found that there is both more concern for female victims and greater denigration of male perpetrators found that only when females are victims do adolescent bystanders intervene in data violence. It's also found that both boys and girls view girls' dating aggression as less serious and much the more acceptable, even controlling for a level of aggression, and also it's more justifiable. Almost all, 96% of surveyed women expect no disapproval for striking a partner. And many studies older than these show males are viewed as culpable, irrespective of circumstances, even when themselves exclusively the victims. Now, this is a really interesting research coming up. Male specific, I peculiar to males, male specific self inhibition preventing their physical aggression towards women and girls has been demonstrated fairly recently, it was first demonstrated in 2003. A decade later, the leading researcher of women's aggression, Anne Campbell, with Catherine Cross, showed in an important series of vignette experiments the effect is not just within couple, but in any context where the target would be female, starkly contrasting with what they found for females. Not only no inhibition at all, but a disinhibited preference for physical aggression, specifically in a couple context. Subsequent research by a series of different teams revealed, first, in hypothetical provocation experiments, men have a threefold lesser propensity to strike a partner than do women. Then, that male self-inhibition extends to hesitating to reciprocate women's hostile actions. This has now been found often to be so strong as to be what's called self-silencing, and this even in the case of otherwise particularly aggressive men. Now, what's more, the hormonal, neural and even genetic underpinnings of this are now known and are evolutionarily highly conserved. That means that uh, uh, you might find the, the, the same uh, mechanism in, say, rodents or even in insects, uh, but you'll still find exactly the same mechanism and the same neural circuitry in primates and humans. It's, it's there throughout most of evolutionary history. Even in primitive species, there's a neural switch activating either dominant submission behaviour or courtship, so we can't do both. These findings 
were anticipated by previous research manipulating genes, which uncovered a sexing algorithm. In other words, when we encounter another individual, the first thing we do is sex them. And this determines then which way the behaviour switch flips, courtship or dominant submission. If a male encounters a female whom for whatever reason is assertive or aggressive, then neither dominant submission nor courtship would be appropriate. So he signals non-engagement in dominant submission terms. And this is through an evolutionary co-option of submission signaling. Now, fine-tuning this male-specific self-inhibition is close contact with a female triggering a male-specific three-tier neural pathway, which nearly eliminates aggression towards females. And this mechanism doesn't make use of any other learning or memory circuitry. It's clearly a dedicated mechanism for this function, which obviously indicates its supreme importance. The genetic underpinning of this is the double sex DX gene, causing reduced aggression by males towards females, yet elevated aggression towards the males. In females, the same gene causes increased aggression, but only towards males. And the particular neural clusters responsible for this have been independently discovered by two separate research teams. Now, moving up mechanistic level to, from the neural to the hormonal, and specifically in humans, oxytocin, which is the hormone associated with pair bonding, of course, reduces reactive aggression in men, but not in women, by lowering their sensitivity to provocation, which is congruent with the finding that men need to be much more provoked to perpetrate PV than do women. Other investigation of oxytocin shows females are prompted to aggress against sexual partners, whereas males are prompted by oxytocin to aggress towards male strangers. Both oxytocin and vasopressin, another hormone, in primates generally, have robustly contrasting effects according to sex, most notably driving female threatening behaviours towards males yet affiliative behaviour to other females. This contrast between male inhibition and female disinhibition is profound. There would have to be something wrong with a male to not be inhibited from physically assaulting his partner. And it's unlikely this will be a defect peculiar to the dedicated neural circuitry read not aggressing against females. More likely, is some defect of much wider neural circuitry within which there's a far bigger chance of malfunction, simply obviously in that there's much more scope for something to go wrong. There would be a general disruption then of inhibition rather than narrowly re-aggressing towards females. The upshot is that a male's PV will be expected to be merely part of his general violent behaviour. The reverse will be anticipated for females. There would be something wrong with a female if she let fight generally, but not if it's just within a partner scenario. This profound sex dichotomy should show up in the crime stat patterns, and they do. Women should be specialists in offending, and the term specialist is used in the criminological literature. Women should be specialists in offending, their PV not being associated with other criminality, contrasting with men being generalists. Study after study from 2005 to this year, including one by Nicola, shows exactly this sex dichotomy. Also, we know from other research, a history of general physical fighting predicts PV for men, but not for women. Uh, comparing male within couple only and extra couple only violent offenders, there are no statistical differences in their characteristics. Male partner violence arrestees exhibit much the more antisocial behaviour. And comparing men convicted of violence both outside and inside the home, or either only outside or only inside the home, reveals them all to be similarly aberrant. All showed marked psychopathy. Now, psychopathy is a unique predictor of male PV perpetration, it's been found. Or more specifically, primary factor 1 psychopathy, or factor 1 especially and additionally secondary factor 2. 
Psychopathy can be described essentially as a developmental order disorder of extreme disinhibition. Meta-analysis reveals male PD is due to antisocial personality disorder, PD, uh, which is closely related to psychopathy. It accounts for an eightfold greater risk of male PD perpetration, especially as manifesting or, co or comorbid with uh, substance abuse. And this is just for male criminals generally. PD is heavily overrepresented in the male prison population. Now, more narrowly, specifically cluster A personality disorder, that's paranoid schizoid schizotypal traits predict male PD, whereas females, it's cluster B PD, that's emotionality, essentially. And this is a study from Nicholas Teen, who state, quote, men's PD has different causes from women's, and possibly the function of the violence is different for the two sexes, unquote. As one of her team points out in another study, quote, A is a cluster that is closest to mental illness. It is possible that men need to be more disordered than women before they perpetrate PV. And she goes on to contrast. It appears as though women's PV may have an element of instrumentality. Previous research has found that instrumental beliefs are related to women's PV. Unquote. The conclusion is that female PV is through anger male due to psychopathy or according to other teens a lack of self-control which is related whereas men's pv seems to be aberrant disinhibition for females it appears to be aggression given a normal free reign now the underlying psychology of female pv is given is variously termed by different research teams relationship anxiety anxious attachment, fearful attachment, interpersonal dependency, or fear of abandonment. All these are characterizations of cluster B PD traits that are further evoked by the male's attachment avoidance. That's the usual male preference for either solitude or being part of a group, uh, but not close one-to-one -one relationship. This spiral, dubbed the, the, dubbed the females insecure attachment, produces great relationship distress, mutually escalating female anger and PV with only or mainly male victimhood, even for male themselves in treatment for PV perpetration. A pattern develops as several teams have discovered where the woman makes some demand to test the male who, instead of engaging with her, becomes avoidant. This, what's called demand withdrawal, couple dynamic has long been known to be female initiated and evidence confirms its cross-cultural reality of women wanting greater closeness rather than independence in their relationships vice versa for men it's shown to be the basis of relationship distress or as others put it reduced relationship satisfaction accordingly it's a woman who both starts and escalates relationship conflict wants more than do men to put the partner in their place, as it were, and is less motivated to avoid confrontation. Now, the root cause here is her need to keep hold of a partner. That this is a female imperative and not for the male is apparent from the tactics used to try to keep hold of the partner, being mainly either peculiar to women and or used mostly by them. To list female, what are called mate retention tactics, vigilance, concealment of mate, monopolization of time, jealousy induction, punishing threatened infidelity, emotional manipulation, love and care, derogation of competitors, verbal possession signals, derogation of mate, and appearance enhancement, don't we know? Uh, men instead employ resource display, possessive ornamentation, giving such as rings, commitment manipulation, e.g. proposing marriage, submission and self-debasement, giving in all the time, and, but to other men envisaged as rivals, not to partners, threats and sometimes violence. The male forms conspicuously are rather more indirect. The findings replicate and build on earlier ones and in turn have been subsequently confirmed. 
uh, as I outlined in the paper. Uh, the most recent investigation stresses as particularly female employees, direct guarding, manipulation, negative inducements and public possession signaling. And findings are robust in extending beyond face-to-face -to, -face to online contacts in researchers stuff that did online surveys. Males tackle rivals, actual or potential, rather than the partner, so male PV will be by displacement. The woman will be a stand-in for the proper target, making it more de facto than PV per se. The bigger range, number and use of female mate retention behaviours fits with what we'd expect because human pair bonding evolved in the female interest not to serve male paternity confidence. As always used to be thought, but research nowadays proves that, but to maximise female fertility. This is achieved in effect by projecting forward in time a woman's peak fertility, a peak attractiveness, through her children being repeatedly sired by the same male. A woman nails down the highest genetic quality male she can possibly acquire when she is at her attractive peak, so she makes use of this male's great genes for each and every conception. Without pair bonding, the father will be different each time and of successively lower genetic quality as the quality of the male a woman can find goes down in line with her own rapid decline in attractiveness as she ages and obviously through the effects of childbirth. On top of this, the much more constant presence of the male partner denies social sexual access by low mate value males, that's lower mate value than the partner, clearing the way for extra pair sex by the woman with males still higher in mate value than the partner. Wow. Cop sounds more complicated than it is. Uh, I suggest you read me paper on pair bonding. Males do benefit in acquiring more fertile females than could be obtained promiscuously, but given the variation in female fertility is much less than the variation in male genetic quality, it's a far weaker fertility announcement than the female gets. Consequently, women value the pair bond far more than do men. Hence the extraordinary lengths traditionally women go to acquire a high mate value pair bond partner in vying with each other to honestly signal future fidelity by face body veiling or, or FGM, you know, Chinese foot binding, etc. Also, the intense focus women have on their pair bond in their everyday communications revealed in major sex differences in phone usage patterns and in women's far greater worry about infidelity, which is notwithstanding the male being the only partner actually at risk of raising another's offspring. The pair bond, pair bond context is central to explaining why PV is predominantly female perpetrated then. Fear of losing her partner drives female PV. There does seem to be, however, another and important motivation for female PV, PMS, premenstrual tension. It's partly directed hostility, it's irritability, moodiness and temporary relationship dissatisfaction expressed by a large or even overwhelming majority of women and often used in mitigation of violent crime. The PMS starts just after the end of the female fertile window and is partly directed is still unexplained in, in the literature. Recent review found wanting all hypotheses of PMS function, but there's a clue in that sex abruptly declines, sexual intercourse abruptly declines after the end of the fertile window. Well, it turns out through recent research and some older research which have been overlooked that sex can severely disrupt implantation of the fertilized egg. So, dissuading the male partner from initiating sex when it risks being damaging will provide an important evolved function for PMS. Amazingly, until you're truly, uh, nobody hitherto had suggested an implantation failure avoidance hypothesis of PMS. Right in my paper. Uh, what's more, the hormonal basis of PMS will be expected to involve estradiol, given its fluctuating levels throughout the female cycle peak during the luteal, that's a non-fertile phase, coinciding with PMS. Also, that levels directly relate to 
symptom severity and are associated with a sharp lowering in the woman's sexual desire for a partner and in how she sees the quality of the relationship at this time. Estradiol levels rise throughout pretty well all phases of the female cycle, falling only at ovulation, uh, when sex would lead to conception, uh, and at menstruation, which itself deters both partners, partners from sex anyway, of course. So PMS may be the visible end of a spectrum of partner-directed negative behaviour throughout most of the female cycle. As estradiol lowers serotonin, it will create the irritability and anger keeping partners at bay when sex would not, or is less likely to, lead to conception or sex will be damaging. The consequent hostility through much of the female cycle to dissuade sex in pushing the partner away is seemingly an opposite motivation to partner retention, but actually is likewise grounded in the ultimate goal of increasing female fertility. To summarise, uh, a comprehensive, bottom-up, multi-level, new theory of PV fully addresses the failure of current theory to fit the data. From fundamental biological principle through genetic, neural and hormonal mechanisms underpinning female mate retention behaviour to assuage attachment anxiety, it's clear female special reliance on pair bonding is the basis of understanding PV with PMS as a not unrelated additional cause. The strength and number of lines of evidence point not just to the predominance of female perpetration, but its distinct functionality and etiology, none of which applies to male PV. In having no apparent function, being the result of dysfunction and more by displacement than targeting, male perpetration is better considered the aberrational minority de facto, if you like, counterpart to female perpetration, with the latter being PV per se. It's high time PV research adopted more thoroughly the wider perspective afforded by evolutionary biology and to look across all sorts of scientific disciplines so as to understand sex difference, nay, sex dichotomy, that is, as both the basis and the main feature when it is apparent and expected to be apparent in a phenomenon as intersexually profound as is partner violence. The end. Thank you.